So, 99 times out of 100, you go into a church in any town USA, not always, but almost always, or often, or frequently, they're going to start out with worship. They're going to start out with worship music. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, flow. Fill your church with joy overflowing. Something like that. That's how they're going to start off. Why? Why? To access a different part of you, to soften your heart, to get you into a place of receptivity. So we go through life carnally minded. This is what the Bible talks about. To be carnally minded is death. You go through life carnally minded to access the spiritual side of you. It's a totally different part of your being. So they are trying to access a different part of your being. You're skeptic. You say they're trying to coerce you. Get your money. Yeah, they're trying to coerce you. Let's be honest. But, but there is nothing inherently wrong with trying to coerce somebody. Keep in mind that you can coerce somebody into having a legitimate experience. You can. Just because they are coercing you doesn't mean they aren't coercing you into something real. And what are they coercing you in? into? They are trying to coerce you into having a relationship with the transcendent. Keep in mind also this, that another word for coercive ability, you know what else we call coercive ability? Talent. That's what we call it. Call it in a, see coercion in a different context. We call it talent. You go to a Guns N' Roses concert. What are they trying to do? They're trying to coerce you into what? Into enjoying their music. And guess what? Guess why? So they can take your money. Yeah, exact same reason. So they can take your money so that you buy the ticket to the concert and you buy their T-shirts and you buy their this and that. That's what talent is. It is coercive ability. So in the church, they are trying to coerce you. What are they trying to coerce you into? They are trying to coerce you into a relationship with the transcendent. A relationship with the transcendent that keep in mind, almost to a man, almost every single person in that church believes to one degree or another that they are in fact having. Truthfully. That's honestly what's going on. You walk into any church in USA, they're going to start with worship music. May the Lord protect and defend you. May God bless you and grant you. All right, well, they're not going to sing Fiddler on the Roof. That's Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah, Fiddler on the Roof is great. Check it out. It's awesome. The music in it is absolutely off the charts. Um, to life, to life, la am, la am, la am, long life. God would like us to be joyful, even when our hearts... All right, never mind. Um, so, yes, the first thing they do is they play worship music because they are trying to coerce you into a relationship with the transcendent. And the first way of doing that is to access a different part of you. Once the, the worship music starts playing and you start getting into the flow of it, you start getting into the experience, a lot of people report... Even people who used to be atheists, a la Matt Dillahunty, report some form of a legitimate experience with what they believed at that time to be the Holy Spirit. Honestly, go watch Matt Dillahunty's thing. Go watch his deconversion video. I've watched it a couple times. It's very common for people who were raised Christian to report that they there was a time where they thought, yeah, I thought I, I experienced God that night and I thought the Holy Spirit was moving through that night. So what happens? So they disconnect from the church. And it's pretty common how Mac Dillahunty went about doing it too. He said there went through, he went, I think he joined the Navy and he started questioning his faith and he started trying to really examine his faith and find out does he believe what he thinks he believes. But what was really interesting, he starts going through this crisis of faith and the struggle with his faith, but how he tried to come back to God or strengthen his faith, he went about it completely the opposite way of how you would actually do it if you were really trying to connect with the, the transcendent, if you were truly, truly trying to connect with God. He didn't say, I fasted and prayed, I started worshiping all the time, I cried out to God. He didn't do anything spiritual. He said, I read books. Honestly, I read books about science, I read books, you know, Bert, Bertrand Russell, I read this book and that book, and then I read books about the Bible and this and that and the other thing. Keep in mind, if we are telling the truth, okay, 
let's just say for argument's sake that I am telling you the truth and that the people in those churches are having a legitimate experience with something, something spiritual. The transcendent is actually there in some, to some degree or another. That those people are perceiving a reality. If those people are perceiving a reality and it is not a delusion, then there is a way of accessing that reality and it ain't reading books. It ain't. That's like saying I'm going to learn how to play the guitar. You know, I'm really struggling with my guitar work. So I'm going to go off and I'm going to read all these books about music and I'm going to read all these books. That's, that's exactly what most atheists do. And then they say, well, I can't find God. He doesn't exist. Well, you aren't really looking the way that he can be found. Honestly, <laughs> you aren't even coming close. So I want to learn how to play the guitar. Okay, here, here's a stack of books. Go read about, you know, musical theory. You can learn a lot about musical theory. You can learn a lot about, you know, the, the dynamics of music and actually learn stuff that may help you. But in order to play a guitar, you have to play a guitar and you have to access the part of you that is receptive to the spiritual. It's a very similar principle. Receptivity is the key. Receptivity is the key. That's why they start with the music because it's trying to break down something inside of you so that you feel what other people are actually legitimately feeling at the church. And what I'm telling you is the God's honest truth. Those people are legitimately feeling something. Something. Is it a mass delusion? That's a little simplistic, don't you think? So the first thing that the street epistemologist will say to me, say, Craig, you had a really powerful experience with the Holy Spirit in your church, you know, once upon a time, 10 years or so ago, and I say, yes. I say, well, what about the guy, the Muslim, who has a powerful experience of Allah in a totally different tradition? What about him? What about him? I guess the underlying theory is I had an experience of God and he had a different experience of God. You know, therefore they somehow cancel each other out and God doesn't exist. No, it doesn't really work like that either. And, in fact, this is why I started getting interested in the idea of perennial philosophy because there are a lot of similarities in these experiences. Yeah, there are differences, but those differences can be about counted for into what your local culture teaches you, what you, te what, what you go in expecting to receive. See, it's really impossible for a human being to think outside of the box of their own time, place, and culture. That is almost impossible for a person to do. Why? Because you don't know what the limits are. You have no idea what's been planted in you by environment, and it's just what you think the way things are. You go through life oblivious to realities that aren't your own, completely oblivious to them. That's what's called growing up, when you start to actually open your eyes and wake up and see other parts of the world. You go, wow, I never knew the world was like that. When you start traveling, that's what happens. You experience other things, and it shifts your whole perspective of what is possible in life. But prior to those experiences, you can't do it. You can't think outside of your own box. Why? Because you don't know the limitations of your box. You have no idea where your box begins and ends. None. And no reference point. So if somebody goes, so in other words, where am I going with this? I go to church in the United States of America. I have a legitimate experience with some form of a transcendent reality. And let's say somebody goes to, you know, Islamabad, has a legitimate experience with some form of a transcendent reality. I'm going to give voice to it the way the Christian church tells me that it is. He's going to give voice to it the way the Islamic tradition tells him that it is. There's almost no other way that can go down. Doesn't mean they cancel each other out. Yeah, there are differences, but there are similarities. That's why you should explore perennial philosophy. If you think these differences are insurmountable, because they aren't. Matter of fact, the mystic tradition, they tend to overlap. That's the whole point of perennial philosophy. That's why I was immediately like, hey, this is interesting. We talk about mystical experiences, tradition to tradition. They're completely similar. They're completely similar. They have a lot of the same things, a lot of the same ideas. It's a much bigger mystery involved in this than most of you people are giving it credit for. And honestly, you aren't doing the homework. <laughs> I'm quite honest with you. You know, most of the atheists I deal with, you aren't doing the homework at all. You aren't even coming close. You have no idea about comparative religion. I could say Sufi mysticism. You have no idea what that is. Honestly, off the top of your head, you probably have no idea what that is. The street epistemologists. Ask them. Ask them about the different religious tradition, traditions because I doubt they've investigated them. I doubt they've actually done the research. I doubt they've actually read 
say, oh, these, these things are all completely different from one another. No, they're not. Go read the Tao Te Ching. Go read the teachings of Jesus Christ. You tell me where the differences are because you're going to see things that overlap. You're going to see things that overlap that look exactly identical. It's the first thing my mom said. I brought home the Tao Te Ching to my mom. I was like, this is really cool and interesting. My mom was like, I like this. This is really spiritual and interesting. First thing she said, hey, this reminds me of Sunday school. <laughs> this reminds me of the teachings of Jesus. The first thing she pointed out. So, anyways, just some food for thought, just some stuff to wrap your brain around. Not to get all excited about kids, but just something to think about for the time being. Amen.